Do you ever find that sometimes you buy a kit and you think to yourself, oh, that's going to be amazing. I'm going to love getting that off the shelf and I'm going to, I'm going to take it home and I'm just going to build it. And then you start overthinking it. Oh, I could add extra details. I could add masks. I could make it into a diorama. I could motorize it. I could add lights. And then it goes on the shelf and it just never makes a reappearance. Sometimes I think it's important just to buy a kit and build it straight out of the box. And that's exactly what I'm going to do with this build. Join me on the workbench today as I show you how I built this kit in only about four hours of actual modeling work. I'm Matt, you're watching Model Minutes, and let's get this down onto the workbench. I haven't actually done an unboxing video on this particular kit. There's not really that much to show. So I'll just do a quick run through here. Inside the box, you'll find an instruction sheet, which is printed in black and white. Not really too much of an issue, seen as this aircraft will be painted overall in one color. However, I would have preferred to have seen these instructions printed in color to make it a little bit easier to understand. The exploded diagrams though, look relatively easy to follow. There is a very small set of decals, and whilst the printing looks to be relatively okay, I do have some reservations about these, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. There's one clear plastic part included in the kit, and it's molded to a relatively good quality, with raised canopy frames, which will be relatively easy to mask later on. The main parts of the kit come on two gray plastic sprues. Generally, the mold quality is quite good with only a little bit of flash being present. And it does feature recessed panel lines and raised details at various places. The kit does look pretty simple though, and I'm sure that there are some scale issues, which again, we'll discuss a little bit later on. As is normal for my builds at the moment, I will cut the parts away from the sprue using my snips and then sand away any rough areas or excess plastic with a sanding stick. Umbral Liquid Poly will be my cement of choice throughout this build. It's a relatively cheap product and it does the job, however there are better alternatives out there. I start off by gluing the air intakes onto the side of the fuselage halves. There's one on each fuselage half so this step is repeated twice. And because I have a habit of forgetting to put nose weight inside my aircraft, I decided I'd do it at this stage here. I've got this liquid gravity, which is small metallic balls, which will add weight to the nose of the aircraft. I used super glue to make sure that these would remain stuck inside the nose, and I applied the liquid gravity to both sides of the fuselage. When that was done, the two fuselage halves were glued together, and the seams were cleaned up using my sanding stick. The engine exhaust nozzles were then glued into place at the rear of the aircraft, with the bottom of the engine area then being glued in as well. On the bottom of this part are two little slots and these take these small fins which are glued into position. The rear tail surfaces can then be glued into their slots on the back of the aircraft. This is then followed by gluing in the wings. These simply pop into their little slots on the side of the fuselage. I decided I would glue in the central pylon on its little holes on the bottom of the fuselage here, just to make sure that I had a good bond with the glue before any paint is introduced. And I repeated this for the underwing pylons for the same reason. This was then followed by installing the front landing gear leg and the front landing gear bay door. I also repeated the step for the main landing gear as well. I think that you could have the landing gear in a raised position on this aircraft if you wanted to do so by simply gluing the covers into the correct places. I've decided to display mine with its wheels down. Humbrol 32, which is a very dark grey, was then used to paint the cockpit area. There isn't really any cockpit detail on this aircraft, it's just a molded shape. So if you wanted to add cockpit details, you'd have to cut this part out and add some scratch built extras. Despite the cockpit canopy being particularly small, I did end up masking it using my normal method, cutting tape to the right size and then trimming it along the canopy frames. 
Humbrol Clear Fix was then used to glue the canopy into position on the aircraft and this glue should dry clear and strong without fogging up the plastic. And now it's time to prime. I've been enjoying using rattle cans recently, so I'm using this number one Humbrol Grey Primer spray paint. And this was applied onto the entire aircraft, as well as the parts which are still waiting to be added to the aircraft. I applied a few thin coats working in a side to side motion. Whilst I've got the spray booth running, I decided that the missiles would be painted with this Hobbycraft white spray paint. The missiles, by the way, seem to be massively out of scale, being particularly too large to depict a 144th scale AIM-9 Sidewinder, but I guess that's something we have to deal with with this kit. For the main colour of the aircraft, I've gone for this Gulf War Desert Pink from Extra Acrylics. This is a paint product I've had lying around since I built my Academy Tornado in the same paint scheme. The only difference was that one was hand painted, but this time I'm going to try airbrushing this paint. I thinned it down with a few drops of Humbrol Acrylic Thinner until it had, and you guessed it, the consistency of milk. I'd say the paint ratio was probably about two parts paint to one part thinner, and then it was airbrushed onto the entire model. That primer I've already applied is acting as a good base layer or a key to help this new paint layer stick to. After a few thin coats, I left that to dry, and whilst it was drying, I applied some Vallejo Black to the tyres of the wheels. I then carefully painted this US Compass Grey onto the central rocket pod. I'd also use this paint on the landing gear legs, which are on the aircraft. Now it's time to apply the decals. I dunked the whole sheet inside of my cup. I didn't see the point in cutting them up because there's not that many of them. As usual, I'm going to use Micro Set and Sol as my setting solutions during this build. So first up, I used the blue bottle to apply the solution to the kit. Then I slid the transfer off the backing paper and into the correct place on the model. You're probably wondering why I haven't applied a gloss varnish or a satin layer to this model before applying the decals. The main reason for that is, although I think this extra acrylics paint is supposed to be a matte finish, it was actually a little bit glossy, so I didn't see the point. It was already fairly smooth. Hopefully, we should avoid leaving any silvering of the decal film, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. I found the decals really easy to apply, and once they were in position, some of the solution from the red bottle was applied over the top to help soften them down further into the surface of the model. Whilst those decals are curing, I used this gunmetal grey colour to pick out the probe on the nose of the aircraft, the gun ports on either side of the fuselage, and also the engine exhaust and heat panel on the rear. Not forgetting the front of the rocket pod, which will go underneath the aircraft. This SMS clear gloss lacquer is running out a little bit, so I decided to thin it down with some lacquer thinner. Hopefully I'll have enough just to finish this kit off. This gloss was then sprayed over the entire aircraft to help protect all of the paint layers and seal in those transfers ready for some weathering. And speaking of weathering, I'm going to be using this blue-grey enamel wash from Humbrol. I do think it's a little bit thick straight out of the pot though, so I thinned it down with some white spirit. When it had reached the consistency that I was happy with, I painted this over the entire aircraft, allowing the wash to seep into all of those recessed details. I left it to dry a little bit, and then I removed the excess wash using a cotton bud with some more white spirit on it. Working in the direction of airflow, it should remove the uh, dirt and grime from the surfaces of the aircraft whilst leaving it in all the recesses, adding some nice contrast. I left that to dry, then I loaded this flat clear SMS lacquer into my airbrush. This was sprayed onto the entire model, dulling down that shine and helping to seal in that weathering. Here I've got some Humbrol Poly Cement which I got from a starter set. It's more of a gel than an actual liquid and I thought it would be perfect at this step to help hold the small parts in place. 
The small parts I'm referring to at this point, of course, is the underslung rocket pod and the four missiles which need to be added to their pylons under the wings. This was then followed by gluing on all of the wheels for the landing gear. And it was at this point I carefully removed the masks from the cockpit canopy and I called my build of the Academy Jaguar in 1 to 144th scale complete. And here it is, my finished 1 to 144th scale Academy Jaguar. I don't think it's too bad for about four hours of modeling work. All in, I think this was a pretty fun build. However, I do have a few little concerns with it. First up, there are some small gaps which I could have addressed. Perhaps a little bit of filler might have been handy. However, I didn't really see the point in bothering with those, so I've left them. If you've spotted them and fancy building this kit for yourself, perhaps you could try and avoid the same mistakes that I made. Talking about those decals, I know I mentioned earlier that I'd come and swing back round to them. There was a little bit of a registry issue. Some of the colours on the decals aren't as matched up or central as they could be. For example, those roundels, they aren't quite as central with the, the colours as I would have liked. Additionally, it has been pointed out that for this particular paint scheme, the roundels shouldn't be the dark blue and red. They should be a much lighter faded tone that was used at the time for this particular paint scheme. Additionally, some of the decals seem a little bit large, particularly the, uh, the name of the aircraft on the nose seems much larger than it should be. But then I think they would have lost the... Uh, detail in the printing. Generally the mould quality of the kit is fairly good however it doesn't quite have the finesse of kits that would be produced today. And with that in mind when does this kit actually date from? Well the tooling dates from 1984. So as far as model kits go it's not the oldest out there but it's not a particularly new release either. And if I've said it once, I'll say it a thousand times, this is a kit which doesn't have its tooling date on the box, so there isn't any real way to know what you're getting inside before you open it, unless you do some extra research. After all, on my box, there was a copyright date of 2019. So you could be forgiven for thinking this was a fairly recent model. And there is one small issue I do have with this kit, and that's the fact that although there is a little disclaimer on the box saying you may not get what's shown on the outside, I think that it would be fair enough to like expect what's advertised on the outside of the box to be what you get. I mean, if we look on here, you can see that we've got a Jaguar in um, camouflage paint scheme, gray and green. And then on the thin edge down here, we've got the same aircraft, but I don't think you're going to see that one unless you buy a much older boxing. Any of the boxings that I'm aware of that are more recent are the desert pink version. And I'm pretty sure that perhaps Academy could have included two paint schemes in this kit if they wanted to. But that being said, I think some of these small issues can be overlooked given the fact that you can pick this kit up for around £4 here in the UK when I was making this video. And that's actually the price I paid for this. So seeing as this is probably cheaper than a large coffee at many of those takeaway places, I don't think it's that bad value for money, especially as you just want to have something like me where you just mess about and have a bit of fun. Perhaps try out some new techniques and skills or maybe some new products. And the reason why I can pick up so many kits and uh, just have a mess about with them is thanks to my Model Club members here on YouTube and over on Patreon. As always, a massive thanks to these guys who are on screen for their extra support. If you'd like to join them, take a look at the links in the description to find out more about the perks that you can get. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the latest members of the club. They are Elliot Groff, Adam Atwood, Benny Big Mac, Alexander Payetikov, Go For It Painting, Ada, Richard Grave, and Diggy Ladd. Welcome to the club. Honourable mention to Crazy Loka for the very generous donation of memberships recently. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways, of course, there is some more information underneath the video. If you're new here though, please consider subscribing with notifications on so you never miss a modelling upload. I hope you've had as much fun watching this video as I did making it and building this kit. I can't wait to see you in the next one. So the last thing to say is a massive thank you to you for watching this 
and I'll see you on the workbench again next time. I find it really funny how massively overscaled those AIM-9 Sidewinders are under this aircraft. Not that I think that um, this aircraft has a particularly realistic loadout for this uh, particular conflict, but I guess Academy have gone with some modelers license. <laughs>